Our study this morning begins in the 14th verse, Mark 9, verse 14 through verse 29. Would you read along with me, please? When they came to the other disciples, that's Peter, James, John, and Jesus. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man, and this should be the man because it's the, the, the focus of the study. The man in the crowd answered, teacher. I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He, he foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. O oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Now, let me stop for a second there because there's some of us that ask God that question. You know, how long are you going to put up with me? The answer I want you to know at the beginning is forever and ever and ever and ever. And if I could do a Billy Graham impersonation, I would. He is never impatient with you. He never gets frustrated with you. He's making a point here, a point I hope you get by the end of this message. Then he says, bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, frothing at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can said Jesus, everything is impossible for him who believes. I'm sorry, everything is possible for him who believes. I'm sorry. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never, and highlight the never, never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, Why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, This kind can come out only by prayer, and some of your translations add, and fasting. Father, as we come to you, this is a tough study, Lord, but it's one that we need. So today, by the power of your Spirit, challenge us, strengthen us, and equip us for whatever comes next, whatever comes the next time that we're out, the unexpected thing. Jesus, have your way in every heart. We love you, God, and we're grateful if there's anyone here in this service who isn't yet born again. That means they don't yet know you, aren't known by you. Lord, would you offer them the forgiveness of sins? Would you offer them a new life beginning now and an unbelievably wonderful life forever and ever. Add to your family. We ask this for your glory. Amen. There has been a story going around Calvary Chapel for nearly 30 years. It's now legendary and probably has been embellished just a little bit over the years. So let me say, like some of the movies that we watch, based on a true story. And I'm sure that through the years it has gotten a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. So I'm just going to relay it to you the way I know the story happened, the way it was communicated to me. It was in the early 90s. There was a pastor's conference at Twin Peaks, California. That's where the conference center that Calvary Chapel owned and the Bible college that I went to was. And during that conference, that pastor's conference, they got a phone call, sort of a frantic phone call from the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department. And the sheriffs, one of them was a Christian. The sheriff said, 
we've got this woman here, and she was a very small woman, but she's absolutely uncontrollable. And we can't get anywhere close to her. The Christian there thought, well, maybe this is demon possession. So they called down to the conference center and asked if maybe some of the pastors would go and see if they could lend a hand. Well, of course, the first pastor to volunteer was Raul Reese. <laughs> Raul is sort of Calvary Chapel's Peter. He's always available. He's always got something to say. And Raul said, well, I'll go. And Steve Mays, who's now with Jesus, Steve said, well, we'll I'll go with you, Raul. And so they went. Now, Raul Reese is like a hundredth degree black belt in everything. I mean, he's a martial artist. He's been teaching martial arts for decades and decades and decades. And he went down there. And there was this little woman. She was in a house. He said, I'll go in and talk to her. He opened the door. And it wasn't long before both Raul and Steve Mays came flying out. And I don't mean they ran out, they were thrown out by this very small woman with unbelievable strength. And as they were wondering what to do next, Rawl, I'm sure, wondering, well, well how did that happen? Um, they called for some reinforcements. A few other pastors came down, and the same thing happened. Pastors went in, pastors flew out, they couldn't do anything with this woman. Again, I want to emphasize, she was a very small woman, and yet they couldn't even approach her. So now they don't know what to do, so they called to Pastor Chuck. And Pastor Chuck, of course, even in the 90s, he was old. Pastor Chuck, <laughs> Pastor Chuck is one of those guys that was born old. <laughs> and, and so he comes up, and he looks at his pastors, and they're caught, and they're bleeding, and they're beaten. And it just, he's thinking, you guys. I can almost hear Pastor Chick saying, how long shall I put up with you? <laughs> well, he went in. He looked at the woman, spoke to the demon, and he said, come out right now. And he turned around and left, and the demon came out. Rawl, of course, said, well, we softened her up. <laughs> But that's basically the story that we have right here in Mark chapter 9. Now, the value for all of us, I doubt anybody in here is going to have to deal with demon possession, at least not often. But the value for us is we always have to be ready for the unexpected. We always have to be ready for the next trial or temptation. And the punchline is simple. The only way to do that is just be with Jesus because he is always ready when you need him. Verse 14 says, When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. Now, you remember our study last time, and you talk about a letdown. Peter, James, John were with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, the most marvelous experience probably in the history of the world, greater than anybody has ever seen. And now they have to come down the mountain, probably still glowing from the experience, and they have to return to normal life. Normal life always happens. Normal life is why we always need to be prepared. It's during the normal routines of life that we sort of have a tendency to let down our guard. Well, that's where they found what Mark describes as the other nine disciples and the Jewish religious leaders in an argument. Now, Matthew's gospel adds that this father had been begging what I call the Jesus nine to heal his son. Now, try to picture the scene. The nine are not far removed from their own demon casting out and healing the sick mission. You remember, Jesus gave them the authority over demons and the authority to heal diseases, and they went out two by two, and they returned just rejoicing because even the, the demons, the demons tremble. And Jesus told them, don't rejoice because the demons tremble, but rejoice rather that I've given you the power to do these things. Whatever 
they were tasked to do, they had the power to do. And so now with this father, this desperate father asking for help, would you please do something? And I'm sure that the other nine would look at one another and look at this father and say, well, sure, casting out demons, no problem, we got this. We do it all the time. The problem, however, occurs, they command the demon to come out, probably using the same formula that they used the last time they went out. And the demon just sort of mocked them and laughed at them. The demon refused to come out. So one moment we've got the transfiguration, this unbelievable event, and the next in real life, an argument over how to cast out demons. Well, that's what normal life is like. All of you got up this morning, you have no idea what's going to happen the rest of the day. But Jesus does. And because I tell you all the time, just be with Jesus, that's the safest place to be because he's always ready and he will prepare you. We have to get used to the fact that mountaintop experiences, those days when everything is going great, mountaintop experiences are always followed by real life. And often it's just worldly junk, ugly stuff. But you see, mountaintops are designed by God to prepare us for everyday life. We don't need to let down our guard. Now, to the delight of this young man's father, Jesus comes down at just the right time. Verse 15. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about? He asked. Now, Jesus always knows the answers to the questions that he asks. The man in the crowd, verse 17, answered, Teacher, and this is a desperate man. I keep emphasizing that because we really need to understand Jesus' compassion here. Teacher, I brought you my son who's possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. Now, Mark leaves no room for misunderstanding. This is a demonic attack, period. I've had people read this and say, well, no, he's just describing epilepsy. Verse 22 makes it clear that this is demonic and that this boy has been the victim of suicide attacks repeatedly, an enemy trying to kill him because that's what the enemy does. He wants to rob, to kill, to steal, destroy. And if we're not on guard, if we're not with Jesus, then we're going to be in his path. Now, Mark is clear that the cause of this particular episode is demon possession. I don't want anybody to infer that if you've got difficulties in life, like we're going to read about in our study today, that is caused by demon possession. If you're a Christian, you cannot be demon possessed. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. It doesn't say greater is he who is in you than the other he who is in you. God won't share his space. He won't share you with the devil. However, we know the devil will harass you. He'll huff and puff and threaten to blow your house down. He might make you think at times like everything is lost. But Jesus is infinitely greater than the enemy. Christians cannot be demon-possessed. Now, I told you, verse 22 makes it clear that these were suicide attempts empowered by the devil. I have to get serious with you for a few minutes because this is an important subject. In the year 2020, it's the last year we have complete statistics, there were 1.2 million suicide attempts in the United States and almost 46,000 deaths. Suicide is the 12th leading cause of death in the United States, and it is particularly epidemic among young adults in the age groups of 15 to 24 years. Not all teenage suicide is demonic in, at source, but much of it is. And it takes the form of the tools that the enemy uses. And moms and dads especially, we need to be on guard. This is to be taken very, very seriously. Social media, drugs, alcohol. Um, I, I, I use social media first because I think that is the biggest oppressor of our children now. I don't think we understand it. I don't think as adults we really take it seriously. Your children are being bullied 
online. Your children are being abused online. Your children are participating in immoral sex online. And when they find out none of that helps, when they find out that they're outcasts, well, we see an uptick in suicide attempts. I would, attempts. I would also add that we're now seeing an even greater uptick in mass shootings done by younger and younger and younger people, as we know just happened in Buffalo. The devil wants to kill your children, and I'm afraid, moms and dads, that we're helping them. Your children are being brainwashed online. We don't understand social media the way they do. And we just think, well, everybody's doing it. It's okay. Let me tell you, it's not okay. And we need to be aware, and we need to keep our eyes and our hearts open as we pray for our children because almost always... The parents say, well, we never saw it coming. Suicide is to be taken very, very seriously. And if you're concerned for your children, please, please get them help. The devil is not funny. The devil is not to be taken lightly. He's playing with the highest of stakes. Back to our study, I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Now, when I read verse 19, I always picture Jesus sort of shaking his head. What am I going to do with you guys? Oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? And then, okay, let's cut out the nonsense. Bring the boy to me. Go get Pastor Chuck. That's what happened 30 years ago. Now, this rebuke is gentle, but make no mistake, it is a rebuke. And Jesus is rebuking his disciples. This, on their part, was a failure of presumption. I'll talk more about it at the close of our study today. But, but they just presumed that, well, well, of course we can cast out the demon. We did it before. And they didn't pray. They didn't seek the Lord. They, they didn't wonder if this was different. They just, well, sure, we can help. Jesus is up on the mountain, got Peter, James, and John, but, but you're lucky we're here. And they presumed that they would be able to do what they did before. Let me say that we can never presume on the power of God. Every single day of our lives and all day, every day, we need fresh power. Every day, we've got to come to Jesus. We've got to come in holiness. We've got to come in righteousness. We've got to come wanting to bring him glory with our lives. We need to come to Jesus because he's the one who knows everything. He is the source of our power. And just as he granted them power, remember way back when we studied this, they, they were gifted for this one occasion, the power of God to cast out demons and to heal the sick. And that's why we need never to presume that what we did before, we can do again. More on this as we close today. Verse 20 says, so they brought him. When the Spirit saw Jesus, you want to know why I take just be with Jesus? Look what happens when the Spirit saw Jesus. It didn't say when the Spirit saw the disciples or when the Spirit saw anybody else. When the Spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell at the ground, to the ground, and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus, with great compassion, Jesus asked the boy's father, How long has he been like this? And the father answered, from childhood. By the way, that indicates it wasn't a little boy as is often pictured in Bible studies. This was a young man whose entire life had been destroyed by demons. I can't describe how desperate this boy's life and his father's life was. Their lives were a living hell. I point that out to you because only Jesus can deliver any of us from a life of misery and pain like this. And if you're here, and I want you to be honest, we're going to see that this father gets honest soon. But if you'll be honest and say, Lord, I, I'm the one in pain. I'm the one whose life is hurting, and, and, and I've been miserable. I feel sometimes like I have no point in life. If you'll be honest enough with the Lord, he'll come to you. And since he's the only source of relief, he's the only help, then you can be among those who are helped today. Don't make Jesus wait for you. You run to him. You'll remember that Mary Magdalene was possessed by seven demons and her life was unbearable. 
Many of the people that Jesus touched through his ministry were lepers and outcasts who had no other source of relief available to them. I want each and every one of us to understand that there's no other source of relief that's necessary. It's just Jesus. The father continues in verse 21, it is often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. I think verse 23, we sometimes read wrong. Jesus isn't saying, like questioning the guy, if you can. Jesus is saying, if I can? That's not what he's saying at all. What he's saying to the man is, if you can. He's saying, of course, I can do this. All things are possible with God. Of course, I can do this. But do you have the faith to believe that I can do it? Now, as this desperate father comes to Jesus, he's coming with the smallest little bit of faith. And he's going to be honest and admit that in a moment. God always answers honest prayers and questions. He's going to admit that in a moment. But you see, all we have to do is have just a little bit of faith. Jesus talked about having the faith the size of a mustard seed, the smallest of all seeds. But he said, that's the kind of faith that can move mountains. Now, Jesus isn't concerned about moving mountains. In Jewish thought, a mountain was a, an impossible problem, a, a mountain so big it's immovable. Some of us feel like that here today. We, we feel like there's just something in my life that's so big, it's so desperate, I can't possibly believe that it can help. Jesus says, just have a little bit of faith. This man comes to him with the smallest bit of faith in an impossible situation, it would be hard to believe that his whole life, this son, his whole life has been like this, and he didn't even dare believe that it could be better. So what Jesus is saying is, it's not if I can. Issue settled. I want all of you to settle that issue in your hearts right now. Jesus can do anything. Now, that doesn't mean we run out and pray for all these crazy things. But Jesus will do anything that's in his will if you ask in faith and if you ask wanting to glorify him. Remember, you've got to be honest. Jesus is saying, of course I can. But if you can, and this man's faith, even the littlest bit of it, is the trigger for the miracle that's going to happen. And Jesus says, will you believe that I can? And that's the question that's being asked. You know, we need to learn to read our Bibles and take Jesus at his word. I talk to you often about the promises of God. For those of you whose lives are not filled with joy and filled with hope, I tell you, read the promises of God and believe them. Do you have just in the faith to believe that God really meant it when he said it? Nothing can separate you from the love of God. If God is for you, who can be against you? We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that's just Romans chapter 8. Do you believe those promises? Jesus will say to some of you, if you can believe, all things are possible. One of the things that hurts my heart especially when people's lives are falling apart or in desperate situations like the one we're studying here, is that we often come to Jesus as a last resort instead of as a first response. When we're sick, what do we do? We take medicine, we make a doctor's appointment, we do all those things. But, but how often do you do those things without first saying, okay, Lord, can you help? I know you can. I have a little bit of faith. I know all things are possible for you. But Lord, would you have pity on me? Or would you have pity on my wife or my sons or my daughters? Would you, would you just help out here, Lord? How many of us go to God first? And I'm afraid that the answer to that question is not very many of us. Why do we wait to go to Jesus until everything else has failed? The woman with the issue of blood that we studied, she spent all of her money on doctors for 12 years. Now, before Jesus came on the scene, we can understand that. But when she saw Jesus, she knew finally that all I have to do is get to him. All I have to do is touch him. She was willing to risk everything to do it. What about you when a problem comes up? What about you when things don't go the way you expect them to or want them to? Do you go to Jesus first? 
you know, one of the things that I get to do here at the church building with the academy here going on every day, I get to see the little kids in the hallway when they're sick. You know, they'll come to get some medicine. They'll come to, to the nurse and, and get some help. Uh, your little germ factories are sick all the time. <laughs> and I see them in the hall, and instantly you know that look. They don't feel good. They're not their normal self, and they're looking all down, and I'll look at them and say, you sick? They'll nod their head, and I always ask them this, has anybody prayed for you? And my response is to say, let me pray for you now. Because I want him to learn that Jesus is the first person we go to when we have a problem and when we have a need. By the way, you'd be surprised how many of those kids get well instantly. That's how gracious Jesus is. Have pity on us. Have mercy on us. That's exactly what he wants to do. And especially with the little ones because he wants to teach them that he loves them, that he's there for them. Why do we go to Jesus as a last resort instead of a first response? Everything is possible for him or for her who believes. Here's the honesty, verse 24. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. It's almost like I, I, I believe, but I don't want to believe because I don't think I can be disappointed. I don't think I can take any more. But then he says this. Help me overcome my unbelief. Now, I know this doesn't set well with everybody, but this is important. We've got so much bad teaching that we have this thing that we think that unbelief and faith never can go together. And then we think, well, I didn't get my prayer answered because my faith is weak or because I have unbelief too. Write this down. Faith and unbelief always go together. The reality is that we always have unbelief mixed with faith. Lord, I know you can do everything, but I just don't think you'll do it for me. As you all know, and you can tell when I misread things, I can't see. And I've had people praying for my eyesight for so many years. I haven't driven in 26 years. And literally thousands and thousands of people are praying. I pray the Lord has spoken to my heart. He's not going to fix this. Not till I get to heaven anyway. But he also says my grace is sufficient, and yet still. The other night, Friday night, the power to heal was here at the afterglow. And I said, Lord, I'd sure like to see again. I'd love to be able to read. I'd love to actually see some of your faces clearly. Didn't get healed. But you see, that's belief and unbelief, and it's always mixed together. The liars and the false teachers will say, no, if you just have strong faith, good faith, and the implication, if you don't get healed, it's your fault. That's not what the Bible teaches. And I want all of you to understand that this man is being honest. He immediately confesses both things, his little faith and his unbelief. And because God can always and will always deal with that kind of honesty, he's going to get the result that he can only hope for before this moment. If you'll give Jesus an honest heart, Lord, I know you do this for other people. I know that you use other people. I just don't believe that you're going to use me. Well, that's faith. Lord, I know you can do it. But I just don't think you'll do it for me. I think if some of you will, will come to God with that kind of honesty, I think what you're going to find is he's going to make some dramatic changes in your life. Give God a chance to show off for you and then through you. Here's the reward when we do. Verse 25 says, When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit, he didn't want to do this as a show. He saw the crowd of people coming, and he just got down to business. You deaf and mute spirit. One thing here is that we need to understand is that the Jewish religious leaders who were there, Jews superstitiously believed that you couldn't cast a demon out of somebody unless you could get the demon to, to say its name. 
they realize that you weren't speaking to the person, the host of the demon, but you're speaking to the demon. So they would say, what is your name? And the demon, demons lie, by the way. Um, they, they, so they believe. But, but in this case, when somebody was deaf and mute, he couldn't speak and they couldn't hear. That meant there was no hope for their situation. And Jesus just completely ignores their superstition. You deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. Can you imagine what hope that would have given to this desperate father at this moment? Because we know how the devil works. The devil would have instantly said, yeah, he's out now, but we're coming back. But Jesus forbid them to come back. And suddenly, this desperate father and his son, now they have hope for a life. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. Now, if I was Jesus, I probably would have said, come out of him now and, and do it gently. But that's not what the spirit did, of course. The boy looked so much like a corpse that the man said, or that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? They accepted Jesus' rebuke. And now they're asking the honest question, where do we fall short? He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. And as I said earlier, some translations say, and fasting. Now, this isn't Jesus calling us to an emergency prayer meeting. You know, we humans, we like formulas. Okay, well, I'm going to fast for three days and then God will answer my prayers or God will take care of this. No, that's not what he's saying here at all. What he's saying is every time you go out your door, you need the fresh presence of the Holy Spirit. You need power. What God did a week ago has no bearing on what God wants to do today. That he used you to do one thing at some time in your life doesn't mean that he's going to use you to do it the same way or do it at all another time in your life. Every single day, God pours out fresh grace. Every day we wake up and we can say, Lord, your grace is all I need today. What about me and what about today? Spirit of God, fill me. Spirit of God, use me. Spirit of God, direct my steps. And when you're walking with Jesus, you have power. Remember earlier when the Spirit saw Jesus, he threw the boy into a convulsion. Well, when the spirits are inspecting you, and remember that Peter says the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, inspecting you literally to see when and how and who he can devour. Don't you want him to be able to inspect you and say, hey, couldn't find an opening. That's what happened when the book of Job began. Satan came before God and God said, you've been checking out my servant Job, haven't you? God wasn't offering him up. God was just acknowledging what the devil had been doing. And Satan said to him, yeah, I have, but I can't get near him because you've got him protected. Now, I don't understand the rest of the book of Job. But here's what I want you to know. The devil is inspecting you. The devil's looking for openings. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Wouldn't it be comforting to know that as the devil is looking for an opportunity to destroy you, he can't get close to you because Jesus is too close. And all you've got to do to make sure Jesus is so close to you that the enemy has no openings is you've got to be with him. That's all you've got to do. And it's so simple, it's so straightforward, and we make it so complicated. We have formulas, I bind you, Satan. I think that's the loudest I've ever spoken in this church. <laughs> we do that kind of nonsense like it's going to work. And Satan just laughs. But when Satan approaches, when demons approach, and you're hanging out with Jesus and you're talking to him, don't waste any time, not one word of your vocabulary, don't waste it talking to the devil. When the devil approaches, when you're being oppressed, simply say, Lord, I'm hanging out with you, so you got this, right? You tuck into Jesus, and you're going to get the same result that this desperate father and his desperate son received.
We've got to just be with Jesus. The disciples presumed because they did it before, they'll be able to do it again. We can't make that presumption every day, all day long, in the presence of Jesus is a completely new and radical source of power. And that's what we've got to avail ourselves of. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 indicates that there are some demons who are way more powerful than others. And this is the case here. Before when the disciples went out two by two, um, it was pretty easy pickings. Jesus gave them the power. They were excited and they would talk to one another about what God was doing. But then they went home and they thought they could do it again. Final thought is this. I meet way too many Christians, especially when you get to be in my age bracket, 50. <laughs> Ish. <laughs> Thank you, Paula. We take things for granted. We tell stories about all the things that God used to do. We tell stories about how we encountered demon-possessed people or how we prayed for somebody and, and they got healed. We pray, tell stories about how we were sharing our faith and people got saved, especially around Calvary Chapel because there's so many people that have been around in, since the old tent days and we get the visitors, you know, when they come into town and they'll say, oh yeah, I was back in the tent days and the spirit was fallen and the love, you could cut it with a knife. The air was so thick with love and the unity of the spirit and miracles were happening. And I always stop them and say, well, well tell me what God's doing now well we're in an RV and we're just traveling around are you telling people about Jesus we can't rest on what we once did moms and dads your children need to see you full of the spirit all day every day you don't get to have a bad day I mean bad days happen that's normal ugly life but you lay it at the feet of Jesus and you say, Lord, because this is how I respond, I need you to respond through me. Your kids, husbands, your wives, ladies, your husbands, they deserve the best you've got all day, every day. And Jesus says, if you believe, all things are possible. It means we're no longer subject to to the ugly things that happen in everyday normal life. We no longer have to be controlled. All we have to do is go to the source for fresh power every day. You know what? It's like going to the gas station to fill up your car, only way cheaper. <laughs> fresh power is available every day. Will you be honest enough now to say, Lord, I believe Help me with my unbelief. Let's pray.